Greetings and welcome to Drumbeat, the rhythm of African American history and culture in South Carolina. I'm Bob P. Larry Huff, and I'm here every other Sunday at 5 p.m. discussing the traditions and rhythms of South Carolina history and culture with various guests. The show is produced by the Wigosia Foundation and presented by the South Carolina African American Heritage Commission. We dedicate today's show to the life, legacy, and memory and art of the late Chadwick Bozeman, a South Carolina native actor and star of the movie Black Panther, who passed away on August 28th at the age of 43 after a four year battle with colon cancer. We plan to devote this show to African-American health before we learned of Brother Bozeman's passing. However, an exploration of the health and well-being of the African-American community is appropriate at any time. African-Americans suffer tremendous health disparities as compared to whites and the leading causes of death in this country, chronic conditions such as heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. And so today we have a historical perspective on African-American health. And I must say that Hartsville, South Carolina is well represented here today because both my guests and I are natives of Hartsville, South Carolina. And my guests are Dr. Gerald Wilson. He's a surgeon and retired from Midlands Surgical Associates. And among many other positions he holds, he is the chair of the executive board of the South Carolina Diabetes Council. And also with me is Dr. Sherman James, a native of Hartsville, but living now in Little Rock, Arkansas. He is the Susan B. King Distinguished Professor Emeritus in Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. And he is also an epidemiologist and has taught epidemiology at several universities, including the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Hello, gentlemen, and welcome to Drumbeat. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And uh, Dr. Wilson, we'll, we'll start with you for purposes of this conversation. Will you give us a definition of health and its importance to quality of life? Well, a good a negative definition of health would be the absence of disease or, uh, or uh, absence of uh, maladies such as arthritis and sort of stuff. However, a better definition, I think, is that uh, health is wellness that is physical, mental, social, uh, and spiritual, uh, because I think that encompasses what we, we strive to get when we want to make people maintain or achieve a healthy status and maintain that. Mm hmm Okay. All right. Well, Dr. James, what has been the general health status of African Americans throughout history, especially since emancipation? Well, Bate, it won't come as any surprise uh, to our audience that the health of African Americans has always been worse than that of and that of white Americans, regardless of what might have been uh, the leading causes of death uh, during any particular historic period. But prior to prior to 1900, uh, for example, the leading the leading causes of, of death in the U.S. were infectious diseases such as cholera and tuberculosis, just to give uh, two examples, and work-related injuries. We don't have very good or reliable data on the magnitude of racial differences in death from 
infectious diseases or work-related injury, injuries prior to about 1900. But we can be fairly confident that African Americans suffered more than whites from these diseases and disabilities, which may have resulted in death in many instances because African Americans were more likely to be poor and undernourished than were whites, which made them much more susceptible to infectious diseases. And they were also more likely to be employed in very dangerous jobs, whether in agriculture, coal mining, or building railroads, and so on. Now, after World War II, infectious diseases were pretty well controlled because of improved sanitation, better nutrition, improved economic conditions, and improvements in medical care. And all Americans began to live longer because of these improvements. But the life expectancy for African Americans continued to lag behind that of whites because whites benefited more than African Americans did from all of these various improvements. Now today, the leading causes of death are heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and stroke. But as in earlier historical periods, African Americans have higher death rates than whites from these particular diseases because our economic circumstances, living conditions, access to good medical care continue to be worse than those of white Americans. So throughout this period, uh, from uh, the, post the immediate post-emancipation period through the uh, balance of the 19th century, well into the 20th century, and of course now into the 21st century, the health of African Americans um, has been worse than that of whites, mainly because the life conditions, the life circumstances, the economic circumstances, reduced access to medical care, inability to pay for medical care, have always been um, worse for African Americans than for white Americans. So that's a general uh, summary. Of, um, of the trajectory of the health of African Americans during the period of time that you asked me to speak to. Mm -hmm. Right, I, I understand, I see. Well, you know, Dr. Wilson, and, and then uh, perhaps Dr. James, if you wish to, you know, uh, speak to this as well, and that is, to what extent is the uh, historical nature of the African American community in this nation responsible for the current health status versus the behavior and conduct of the community itself? How much are is the society and the conditions responsible, the social determ determinants, I would imagine, and just how much is the responsibility on the community individually and collectively? Dr. Wilson. Well, I think you have to start off by, by looking at uh, what the nature of this country is. I listened to sociologists speak when I was in medical school who talked about uh, the Darwinian effect of, of slavery. You know, slaves were brought here and it was a selective process that really the only the fittest survived, were able to survive one getting to this country. Uh, and then after getting here, being subjected to the slave conditions that they lived under. So you had sort of uh, the genetic predisposition for healthy individuals that were brought here. But then they're brought to a capitalist country where uh, money speaks, basically. And in this system, uh, because we've always not been privy to the, uh, the power that existed in this country, we've always been on the short end of the stick when it comes to being, being able to access uh, appropriate health care. Then you add to that the fact that medical uh, therapies that have developed have always been developed based on the population that's been tested on, and we've not been included in that, except under certain circumstances. 
Uh, and that's what's resulted in distrust in the system. We've had incidences like uh, the Tuskegee experiment where, where Blacks were diagnosed with syphilis but were not treated to see what the long-term effects would be. Where you have Henrietta Lacks whose cells, cancer cells, were used to significantly further treatment for uh, cancer and diseases, but she never benefited. She nor her family never benefited from that. Uh, that creates a mistrust in the system that exists. And when you ask about whether or not we as Black folks, what responsibility we have with regards to uh, the conditions that we live in uh, and, the, and the health status that we have, a lot of it has not been because of what we have control over. And I think now if, that we know the disparities that exist, it's important for us to educate ourselves to take responsibility for our health to try to improve it so that we don't have these glaring disparities that exist. Mm -hmm. Well, I ask that question because uh, much of what I read even from federal agencies like the uh, Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say that many of the chronic conditions that African Americans suffer from are due to lifestyle choices. You know, well, it, and again, it, and all the, life, the, the, the lifestyles that we uh, have existed under have been pretty much uh, forced upon us in, in the South in almost every uh, town in the South you go to, you could determine where black folks live versus where white folks live because of the uh, the relationship to things like drainage dishes, ditches, uh, environmental pollution, uh, things like this where our neighborhoods existed. And then we also have these things that are now called food deserts, where we're able to get healthy food, nutritious food, oftentimes is not available to us. And and because of the low economic status for the most part that we've had, most of the time we've, we've been relegated to eating foods that are very, not very nutritious and therefore result in chronic um, diseases that exist at higher numbers among us. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, in, in addition to that, uh, Dr. James, uh, you've done a lot of work in social epidemiology which uh, has found that there are other determinants to that uh, um, stress, I guess you could say, from the various factors that impact on health, uh, in addition to diet and other issues. Talk to us about John Henryism. Well, uh, I guess I'll begin with the definition. Um, I define John Henryism as a, um, a strong uh, predisposition, a strong inclination to engage in high effort coping to deal with, um, to deal with adversity. And that adversity can take the form of financial hardship. Uh, it can take the form of um, of being unemployed or underemployed. Uh, it can take the form of, of just having you know, too much responsibility, uh, particularly, this would, this would be particularly the case, for example, for African-American women who have so much responsibility for, uh, for aging parents, uh, for younger people, not only their, their own children, but other people's children uh, as well. Um, so people just, so African-American folks, uh, just have a lot on their plate all the time. And they, uh, they don't give up on trying to uh, make ends meet, uh, trying to hold communities together, trying to make sure that the church that they uh, belong to uh, functions well. Uh, they extend themselves uh, to, to try to make the community in which they live uh, very strong. And then, of course, they have to deal with uh, systemic racism, um, discrimination uh, at work, uh, discrimination in the healthcare system, and uh, all of these things wear on people. They they they, they really they really induce um, a lot of physiological wear and tear. But struggling to to overcome this kind of adversity 
refusing to give up in the face of these very difficult challenges, which, which confront them in so many different walks of life, uh, can, have, can take a physiological toll on their health. So, so John Henryism, which um, takes its name from the legend of John Henry, the steel driving man, and many, perhaps you know, some members of the audience will, will, uh, will know the, about the story of the, of the legend of John Henry, the steel driving man. He was challenged to uh, compete against a mechanical steam drill um, in order to save his own job and, um, and that of his fellow workers. He was a railroad worker. And um, so he was challenged to compete against this newly invented mechanical steam drill. The period of time is like the 1870s. And um, so he rose to the challenge. He beat the mechanical steam drill in the steel driving contest, but he dropped dead uh, immediately after his victory from complete mental and physical exhaustion. And so I, so I met a man by the name of John Henry Martin, whose life story really echoed the, the legend of John Henry. And um, he had a lot of stress-related health problems. He had high blood pressure. He had a debilitating case of osteoarthritis, and he had a severe case of peptic ulcer's disease, which required that 40% of his stomach uh, be removed. And, um, but he just worked night and day because he wanted to be um, an independent farmer. He didn't want to be a sharecropper like his father had been and his grandfather had been. And he managed to pay off uh, his farm, 70 acres of fertile North Carolina uh, farmland uh, in five years, which is really quite remarkable. But he had all these health problems uh, that resulted from just having um, gone against the machine, the sharecropper system, uh, in the way that he did, so that he could he could be economically independent. And um, it seemed to me that that really was the story of of our people. That was sort of the story of African Americans, you know, having to go up against the machine, and the machine takes on a different face at different uh, points in history, but it's always there. And the, the fact that our people have refused to give up in the face of these systemic forces designed to uh, hold us in place, to subordinate us, to take advantage of us, uh, and yet we have resisted those forces uh, in an effort to live our lives with dignity, to take care of our families, to take care of our communities. And that's sort of how I understand uh, where, in what ways stress, chronic psychological stress, contributes to the early onset of cardiovascular disease, cardiometabolic diseases, high blood pressure, diabetes, above and beyond the role that obesity might play, above and beyond the role that poor diet might play, uh, there, is a, there is a role for stress, and I locate that stress uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the systemic pressures that have always operated uh, on African Americans to subordinate us, and then our refusal to be constrained, to be denied our opportunities to progress in this society uh, because, of, because of racism. So there's a, there's a price to be paid, there's a physiological cost to be paid um, and having to uh, engage these systemic uh, forces of racism and subordination. Hmm. Well, that's a very sad commentary, I have to say. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? I couldn't, I couldn't hear you. Can you? So, you have any thoughts on, on Dr. James's comments there? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, I, I think there's a significant data that is now being accumulated. Uh, it appears that uh, chronic inflammation is a significant component of the chronic diseases that we see. And one of the uh, things that can cause chronic inflammation is, is stress. Just like he talked about John Henry Martin having peptic ulcer disease uh, as a result of all of the things he was having to deal with which increases acid production and then causes further damage to the digestive system. Uh, but this chronic inflammatory disease is, is, if we think about where we are right now with COVID-19, we are dealing with something that is a stress, that is stressing everybody, but is stressing those among us who have the least ability to deal with it even more and still having to function. 
a mother still having to feed her children, having to take care of them. They're not able to, to go to work because they have to take care of the children. Um, it puts us in a position where we're exposed to significantly more stress. And we talk about the definition of health. And one of those components was social wellness as well as mental wellness. Uh, this is adding to the stress that we're having to deal with already. And it's creating a position where we're going to see more and more problems as a result of that. I think it is closely tied to the chronic diseases that we see. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, diabetes, one of the ways we try to, to help patients deal with diabetes and, and avoiding the consequences of it is to teach lifestyle changing, lifestyle changes to reduce the stress that's in their life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, so back to back to me, I may I add just one, yeah. one footnote to, to the, the John Henryism story. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's important um, for yet another reason. And and I think it 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 contradicts this notion uh, that is so prevalent uh, in American society that African Americans don't have a strong work ethic, that African Americans are lazy, that they don't take personal responsibility for their lives. And the John Henryism uh, theory uh, really contradicts that. Uh, in my studies, um, I, I have observed time and time again that African Americans uh, score very high on what I call, you know, the John Henryism scale. And, a, and a, an important component of John Henryism is a strong work ethic. And so these people believe in working hard. They believe in taking responsibility. It's just that they have so much on them, so much working against them that when they, you know, when they double down, when they really invest in trying to go move forward in life against these systemic forces um, uh, in society, you know, then over time, over a period of, of years and decades, you begin to see the physiological consequences uh, of that. So I just want to emphasize that the, that the John Henryism uh, construct or term uh, flies in the face of this negative stereotype of black people not being, uh, not having a strong work ethic, not wanting to take responsibility for their, li for their lives and not being dependable. Uh, that is a lie uh, because mm -hmm. the overwhelming majority of black people uh, really want to be successful and they want to be successful in the way that all other Americans want to be successful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what is the African American community's saving grace, I guess, when you consider that, you know, they're the challenges that you both face, uh, both expressed, social, economic, et cetera. And then on top of all that, you have a medical and healthcare system that hasn't always uh, been responsive, you know, to the needs of the African American community, and not only that, have been guilty of some pretty heinous crimes, as you mentioned, uh, Henrietta Lacks and the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment. So, how does our community reconcile their mistrust? of the healthcare system with the need for adequate health care. How do you reconcile that? And Dr. Wilson, what role does the black physician and other black medical professions play in addressing that mistrust? Well, uh, starting from the, the standpoint of the providers of health, uh, the National Medical Association is the Association of African-American Physicians uh, which started because we were not be able to join the American Medical Association. And in around, around 1999, 2000 or so, there, there was a call to see if there was any proof to the fact that there were significant disparities in healthcare in the United States. And if they wanted to see if they could collect you know, enough articles that actually showed that there were disparities based on race. Uh, they thought they might be able to get some, Originally, they were able to find around 800 articles. There were things that were, that were obvious, uh, such as the, the studies that showed in the VA hospital system where veterans have the same insurance, whether they're black or white, and access to care. 
uh, black veterans were not referred for cardiac surgery as often as white veterans. And the opinion was by the cardiologists that they, they wouldn't follow through with post-operative care like whites would, uh, which is purely an opinion, it has no factual basis whatsoever. Uh, and then later on, we found that if you even looked at black cardiologists, the referral rates in the VA system were the same as whites because they were being trained by those white cardiologists. So the NMA has you know, made an effort to try to make sure that we are looking at those disparities and why they occur and to try to do something about making sure they're corrected. From the standpoint of the responsibility of us as African-American citizens, as patients, it is up to us to try to educate them as much as possible on what is necessary for good health. If we think about studies that are done to determine, you know, healthy lifestyle, the Framingham study and all, it's basically based on white people. We have not had participation in studies enough as blacks to determine whether we should have the same treatment until we recently have had some uh, pharmaceutical studies that come out to show that there are some drugs that work more effectively in African Americans than in others for things like hypertension. We need to have ourselves educated about that so that when we are in the healthcare environment, when we go to see the doctor, we have as much information that we want to get from them as they may want to give to us. We need to go and tell them, I'm concerned about being screened for uh, diabetes, for hypertension, for colon cancer, for prostate cancer. We need, to, we need to make sure that those things are being done rather than sitting and waiting for them to tell us what they're going to do as far as taking care of us. Hmm. Might some people in the community or the community at large need to be trained to to do that sort of thing? Because I, I've known people throughout my life whose uh, approach is just go to the doctor. If you're in pain or discomfort, tell them, you know, you know, how you feeling? And then it's just accept whatever prescription he gives you, whether that's medicine or, 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 or some something else. So, yes, so that's, that's been, that has been the, uh, the pattern. What we're trying to, to do now is to, to have patients recognize that, that paternalistic method of treating where you go in and the doctor tells you what you need to do needs to be a shared experience where you participate as much as the as the provider for you that is that you have a concern if you're diabetic you need to go in and find out well what is my a1c running is it is it where it needs to be um, we need to be making those choices that are giving us a healthier lifestyle uh, it's 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 from cradle to grave really so we have to we have to start teaching that to our children as they as they come up uh, and I think South Carolina State University had a, uh, a, a program where they were do, treating, teaching nutrition to their students with the opinion that if they teach the students how to be, how to eat nutritiously, when they go home, they'll introduce that to their families and the families will start doing a better job of that too. So, you know, multiple attacks have to be taken in order to try to change the behavior patterns that have resulted us with us having these leading numbers in chronic illnesses. Mm hmm Okay. All right. And uh, what about that from an epidemiological perspective, uh, Dr. James? Well, um, I would just reinforce a lot of the things that uh, Dr. Wilson uh, has uh, offered. Um, but I'll begin by saying that um, we also know that, uh, that having, um, having a physician uh, who looks like the patient and, and can understand where the patient is coming from and who is a good listener, but who sees himself or herself in that patient and who when he or she looks at the patient's child sees his or her own child in the patient's child. So the ability to identify with the patient is hugely important. And, um, and, if, and, and African-American physicians are, are, are better prepared to do that with their African-American patients than most 
white physicians are because white physicians bring their life experiences into the, into the doctor-patient encounter. For the most part, uh, they live in very affluent neighborhoods. They have very little contact with black people. If they're churchgoers, they, they, they don't go to the same churches that black folks go to. And so they might have a 10 or 15 minute interaction with a black person uh, or multiple 10 to 15 minute interactions with black patients over the course of a, of a day of seeing patients and they go home to, and they live very separate lives. So it's, it's much more difficult for them to walk in the shoes of the black patients. And, and black patients understand that. that. Black patients are paying attention not only to what the physician says, but how the physician says it. The patient is reading the nonverbal cues uh, direct, you know, eye contact, smiles, signs of respect. Uh, the, the patient is processing all of that information. And so uh, a lot has to go on in the first minute or two of the doctor-patient encounter that will put that patient at ease and will communicate respect to the patient and then trust will begin to build. But that's obviously a long-term process. It's not going to complete itself, you know, in a in an, an initial encounter. It's going to take multiple encounters. But when physicians are open to that, when they understand that that's the emotional relation building work that they have to do, if they're going to get that patient to uh, act uh, appropriately on the recommendations and get better, hopefully, in the process of following through on the recommendations, then that's the work that needs to happen. And so, um, as Dr. Wilson said, you know, the, the way that um, medical students are trained uh, needs to take um, greater cognizance of, of these relationship building factors and the fact that there's going to be a lot of distrust uh, at the outset. So that's one comment. Now, the second comment has to do with the importance of getting out of the healthcare setting, doctors, nurses, nutritionists, pharmacists, and getting into the community and interacting with people where they live on their territory. Churches are a very good place to begin to build those kinds of relationships where you're not on this very strange, intimidating kind of uh, setting, you know, the hospital environment with whistles and machines whirring and carrying on. It's a very alienating environment for a lot of people. So meet people where they live, go to places where they feel comfortable and begin to build relationships there. So in my work uh, as a, um, not just as an epidemiologist, but as a health interventionist working in, working in communities, working in black communities, both in the South and in the urban North, we organized uh, intervention programs with churches and we brought uh, physician uh, collaborators, uh, pharmacists, nutritionists, you know, into those, uh, into those communities, into those settings. And people were very receptive to information that was being um, passed on to them by physicians, the kinds of things that uh, Dr. Wilson was talking about, the importance of diet, uh, the importance of physical activity, the importance of stress management. And we help people to learn how to read labels uh, when, when they grow, uh, when, they, when, they, when they went shopping. We organized uh, walking clubs so that people felt safe in some of the more uh, perhaps unsafe uh, uh, neighborhoods. And so we, we try to create um, a culture, a culture and an environment where people could be open to learning new things and then acting, uh, acting as a group or uh, within a group setting are uh, making these kinds of behavioral changes, putting into practice the things that, that they were learning from the healthcare professionals that we brought in, that we put in contact uh, with them. So I think that, um, I think that there are things that can be done uh, within the healthcare uh, setting to to really improve the, the doctor-patient uh, relationship. I've talked about that. And I think that getting healthcare professionals out of their environment and into a more neutral environment or into an environment where the people, where low-income people, people of color feel more at home uh, and working with them and helping them to move along and, and trying to exercise as much control over their lives and their health as they possibly can, even in the face of these very difficult neighborhood conditions, that so many of them have to live under. Mm -hmm. 
Nice Can I add to this? I, I, yes, I appreciate you you saying that, Dr. James, because that that is the crux of what we're talking about. It's really public health. Uh, public health is getting out of the hospital setting and getting into where the communities actually participate and making sure that all members of the community are healthy and safe. Um, example of that is our diabetes prevention program that we've, just, we've uh, set up in various locations in the state. It allows people who are pre-diabetic before they become di diabetic to go and to learn about reading food labels, about nutrition, appropriate, appropriate nutrition, about exercise, they exercise together. Uh, and we can actually prevent them from becoming diabetic and improving their health. Uh, one of the things we have to, to deal with on a constant basis are myths that exist in the community, uh, like diabetes. Well, my mom had diabetes, so I think I probably get it, get it too. That's not necessarily true. Um, the myths that people believe about, um, uh, what well, we talked about uh, uh, Chadwick Boseman and, and developing colon cancer, the, the, the horror stories that people tell about having a colonoscopy done, they need the, the actual information that is necessary for them to make a decision that this is going to be beneficial for them. I've heard black men say they refuse to take the blood pressure medicine because if they take the medicine, they can't perform sexually. Um, that that could be true. The medicine may be doing that, but there are other ways to deal with that. So the question is whether you want to be asexual and and and, and have hypertension to the point of uh, sexually have hypertension to the point of death, or uh, treat the hypertension and deal with the consequences from a standpoint of how it can be handled medically. So education is essential. Getting out of the hospital setting, getting into the community is important to make sure that we all live healthy lifestyles, that we're all seeing the best that we can in each other. And I think that's another thing that is true of African Americans. That is, we tend to be communal. We, we tend to be uh, operate in a community setting. We look out for each other. Unfortunately, the, the restrictions that have been placed on us by COVID-19 have hampered that somewhat, but we are finding ways to get around that. And I think that's a wake-up call for us to realize that we can only get better if we help each other. Mm -hmm. Very good. And well, finally then, where has COVID-19 left the African-American community in terms of their um, overall health status now and going forward? I read somewhere where a physician said that it's going to take a long time for the African-American community to recover from COVID, not only physical, physically, but because of the mental and emotional stresses that you alluded to, that all of this has cast a pall over the, the community that uh, uh, kind of suppresses its collective immune system. You know, leaving it open. Well, well you know, to, to I'll let Dr. Dr. James respond to this, but basically, what I want to tell you is that what COVID 19 done is pulled a scab off the festering wound that has to deal with chronic disease that has existed among us at a higher rate because our immune systems have been compromised by all of these things that we've been talking about. I don't think it's going to be any difference in the long term effects over what we've already been suffering. It's just made us acutely aware of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And Dr. Jane. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. It has, this pandemic has revealed a lot of um, pre existing uh, inequities, uh, health inequities, economic inequities, uh, and so on. And we know that um, African Americans are overrepresented in low wage uh, frontline jobs. In, uh, in, in, in jobs that require um, contact with people and oftentimes uh, without uh, appropriate protective equipment. Uh, and, and so, and they have to go to work. They have to go to work because oftentimes, uh, you know, the wages are very low, uh, they, they, they don't have paid sick leave. And so they have to put themselves in a sense in harm's, in harm's way. And when they come back home, you know, they'll come back oftentimes to three generational households. There's a grandmother, uh, you know, a grandfather, 
uh, in the in the home. There are small children in the home, and um, and so those individuals, you know, run the risk of of, of becoming exposed. And and so when we look at racial differences in COVID nineteen deaths, we see um, we see remarkable differences uh, uh, in terms of COVID nineteen deaths among older African Americans compared to older white folks. And it's because older African Americans have had high blood pressure, had diabetes for decades. So now when they get exposed to the uh, to the virus, even though they themselves are not going outside of the house, but the virus is coming uh, home to them in many instances, not in all instances, you know, then they're going to suffer the most severe consequences. When you when you look at at the the children who are um, being exposed to COVID-19 and who are suffering uh, severe consequences from uh, exposure to COVID-19. African-American and Latino children are overrepresented among those children who are uh, suffering the most severe consequences of COVID-19. And again, it's because of the same sort of living conditions, low wage workers, no paid leave, uh, people have to go to work, they don't always have the protective equipment that they need uh, to avoid exposure. And so you get this uh, snowball effect, if you will. And, um, and, and they're living, in, they're living in, in households that are multi-generational, where there's crowding, where there's a lot of stress. And so I do think that, I do think that the COVID-19 pandemic is taking um, a tremendous toll uh, on the African-American uh, community. And, and that toll is not only gonna manifest itself in terms of, of um, prolonging health disparities and creating some new kinds of health disparities, but there will be long-term economic consequences as well. And I think that the implications of this is that, um, again, going back to the role that, that, that healthcare professionals can play, that, uh, that other kinds of community leaders can play, political leaders can play. We need to be, everybody needs to be aware of, of, of what is coming down the road, aware of how the long-term consequences, both health and economic, will be greater on the African American community than perhaps on, on other communities. I should say African American and, and, and Latino. They're also going to be experiencing some of the long-term health and economic consequences of, of this pandemic. And so it's gonna require all of us to be much more proactive if we're going to try to minimize the, um, the devastating effects of, 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 of this epidemic. And so it's going to require some out of the box thinking, some new kinds of thinking, uh, than than I think has characterized the way that we have gone about business, you know, up up to this point. So, so this is going to require a new kind of response. And I just hope that that those of us who care about, you know, care about these matters, uh, are already, you know, thinking about how what that response is going to look like, what it needs to be, because it's going to be it's going to be significant. And, um, and it's gonna require much more sort of um, creativity and determination uh, to, you know, to bring about, um, uh, to minimize the, the most severe consequences uh, of what we're now experiencing. All right, very good. And a, a good closing thought. And so Dr. Wilson, any closing thought from you? Well, as a you know, as a practicing surgeon, I worked for years you know, basically on one patient at a time, uh, doing the best to try to maintain some degree of health. And um, now that I've retired, I've taken on more of a, uh, a role in public health and looking at the overall aspects of of healthy communities. And my work with the Diabetes Advisory Council, with the uh, South Carolina Cancer Alliance, with the um, Behavioral Health Coalition, and with We Are Sharing Hope, which is a uh, organ procurement agency. Uh, in all of those, I see you know some trends that basically are the same, and that is that unless we take care of the least of us, we wind up paying the consequences of that on the backside, where the expense is much greater. So, if we can do as much as we can to prevent these chronic diseases that exist. And we, and we target the communities where they exist the most, um, that's where we're gonna get the best bang for our buck when it comes to maintaining uh, health, decreasing health costs, 
and having a healthier environment for our, our, our citizens, particularly African Americans. Very good. Very good. So may I may I just add something yes. very quickly to that? Yes. Um, in the political environment in which we now find ourselves, and I hope that it's a time limited, you know, political environment that things will change. Um, but one of the things that we know from from history, from public health history, is that when you invest in communities, when you improve the physical conditions, when you and certainly when you improve the social conditions, when you invest in education, when you invest in healthcare, when you make it easier for people to actually have access to health care through Medicare, through Medicaid, you see pretty quick improvements uh, in health. Uh, and we all know that, that investing in early childhood education uh, really pays off down the road, pays off down the road for the individual and for communities in terms of economic returns, in terms of health returns. The scientific literature is very, very clear on the positive benefits that you get from investing uh, in young children and, and investing in in um, in future mothers so that so that uh, women when they get pregnant can actually have have can actually deliver healthy healthy babies so so we need to have political leadership we need to we need to demand from our political leadership that that the wealth of this society, that some of the wealth of this society gets invested in places, in communities where it can do a tremendous amount of good. And as I said, the public health evidence is really very clear. When those investments are made, you see a, you see a nice return on those investments, economically, health-wise, and you have more stable social communities as well. People feel better about their lives. Uh, Dr. Dr. Wilson said at the very outset about, you know, health is not just sort of physical, but it's, it's psychological, it's emotional, and it's spiritual. And so when, when you invest in people, when, you, when, when our political leaders let people know that, that they are valued, that their lives matter, and then they put the money where their mouth is, this is how you create health. This is how you create a healthy society and a robust and healthy democracy. And it's achievable. This is doable. You know, it's not rocket science. This is doable. And so this is how I think, this is what I think, this is what we need to be working toward as we go through this pandemic and as we get on the other side of this pandemic, the things that have been revealed to us, the inequities that have been revealed to us, we should regard those things as simply unacceptable, intolerable, and go about fixing them. And that's a matter of civic engagement, enlightened political leadership, and the kind of determination, quite frankly, that our people, African-American people, have always, have always shown throughout history, which is why we are still here, which is why we are still here and still very much in the struggle. Thank I can you. only say amen to that. <laughs> Amen to that. All right. <laughs> Dr. Sherman A. James is the Susan B. King Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. And Dr. Gerald Wilson is a retired surgeon from the Midlands Surgical Associates and also uh, chairman of the executive board of the South Carolina <clears throat> Diabetes Council. Thank you both for being with us on Drumbeat today. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you very much for having us. Okay, folks, we'd like to thank you for tuning in and, and joining us on Drumbeat today. We hope you'll join us again two weeks from today at 5 p.m. as we explore more African-American culture and history in all of its glory. So until the next time, you've been listening to Drumbeat and I am Bob T. Larry Huff.
If you'd like more information about the South Carolina African American Heritage Commission or the Georgia Foundation, you can go to their Facebook pages, South Carolina African American Heritage Commission, which will give you information about their websites. And as for you, Wegoja, just go to wegoja.org. So until next time, I'm Bob T. Larry Huff. I love you. May God richly bless you. And I wish you peace. Please be well. Encourage you. Good for you.